probably familiar with the Sermon on the Mount. Even people who aren't Bible readers know the golden rule. That comes out of the Sermon on the Mount, you know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Then there are very famous phrases like being the salt of the earth, the light of the world. There's teaching in there about not judging others, loving your enemies. It's all there in the Sermon on the Mount, including the famous Lord's Prayer. It's a very famous sermon. You can find it in Matthew's Gospel. There's a three-chapter spread that covers all of it. What I would like you to see today is the secret hidden in plain sight that comes at the end of the Sermon on the Mount that involves the land of the Bible. At first glance, the parable that Jesus tells at the end of the Sermon on the Mount is a nice story offering a house-building illustration. The point, you want to build your spiritual house on a rock-solid foundation. And whenever you do what Jesus said to do, then you've got that solid foundation. But if you hear what Jesus said and don't do it, you might as well build your house on sand. And to most of us, that's all there is to it. It's a nice story. Move on to the next passage. But the people hearing Jesus tell that story knew the illustration was extremely serious. They knew this was a matter of life and death. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine, Jesus said, and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the wind blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. You'll find that, of course, in Matthew 7, verses 24 through 27. You've got to know the land of the Bible to really understand the power of this story. Israel is a very thin, narrow land. Along the Mediterranean coast, you'll find a wide stretch of flat land known as the coastal plain. The hill country lies a few miles inland, and from there, it's a sharp rise up to the Judean mountains. These mountains are not very tall, only about 2,500 feet above sea level. That's around Jerusalem and Bethlehem. But from there, from that high point, the land takes a dramatic plunge downward. The Dead Sea, it's only 15 miles from the ridge of the mountains, and it lies 1,400 feet below sea level. That's the lowest place on earth. So when it rains on the mountains, some of the water gathers in streams, moves into valleys, and begins a long, winding journey downward. At first, the water is simply a traffic hazard. Modern-day drivers have learned the hard way not to cross roads when when the rains come, when the flash floods start to build. Even the smallest of streams can take your car away. But as the water gains speed and joins with other streams in the desert, impromptu rivers form and a very dangerous situation develops. The flash floods are very dramatic, And it's an amazing sight to see as long as you are standing on solid ground. As long as you're watching from a distance, it's a beautiful thing to see. Now, after the flash floods pass, usually taking only a matter of minutes, the dry and barren Judean wilderness begins its return to its normal environment of being a desert. But if you'll take a hike into the canyons on a day when it's safe to go there, you'll notice a phenomenon. For when the flash floods are gone, a bed of sand is left behind. That may not seem unusual to you. You probably see a lot of sand wherever you live. But for a resident in Israel, sand is a most unusual sight. Visit the Golan Heights, the Galilee region, the shoreline of the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River Valley, Samaria, and Judea, and you'll not see a collection of sand anywhere. Even the beaches of Israel along the Mediterranean Sea have only a narrow strip of sand. But hardly anyone hearing Jesus preach had ever been to the Mediterranean. Instead, people hearing the Sermon on the Mount knew that Israel is a land of rocks. The terrain is rugged and difficult wherever you live. Farmers and shepherds have their work cut out for them, whether they live in the Galilee or in Judea or in Samaria. Construction workers have to work hard as they clear out rocks and cut into stone in order to build roads, homes, or other structures. To a people living along those rocks, seeing the sand at the bottom of the canyons of the Judean wilderness would have been a sight 
they would have never forgotten. And as surely as they had seen the sand, they must have heard the warnings about the life-threatening flash floods that came every winter to these canyons. Now think of what Jesus had to say. The foolish man builds his house on the sand. The rains fell, the waters rose, and his house, to use Luke's word, exploded. His point, a foolish person who hears what Jesus says but never gets around to actually doing it is like a man who built his house in the worst place possible. The illustration is so good once you understand the lesson that the land has to offer us. For a person building on the sand might get a nice house built. And even for a time, building on the sand might look like a good decision because it's easy to build there. You can build it quickly. It's a nice flat environment. And it's even possible a winter or two winters might pass without a flash flood coming through that particular canyon or that particular home site. But sooner or later, building a house on the sand is one of those, one of those decisions that will end in complete destruction. Isn't it amazing how the land illustrates the power of what Jesus had to say? The audience around Jesus knew better than us that to build a house on the sand was, my goodness, what a foolish decision. And they also knew something else. Israel is dominated by rocks. Yes, it might be difficult to build a house on such a rocky land, but all in all, it's really the only option. Sometimes this story can seem kind of frightening. It looks like you've got a 50-50 chance of succeeding in discipleship, in succeeding at following Jesus. But the reality You'd actually have to work very hard to build your house on the sand. You would have to ignore the warnings of many people who would come right up to you and tell you, don't do this. It's very foolish. It's sad how often we do exactly the opposite of what Jesus told us to do. And it's tragic when we reach a day when the poor choices we've made in life catch up with us. And most of us know what that's like. Build your house on the sand, ignore what Jesus said to do, and it might cost you your marriage, your money, your health, your healthy relationships, and even your freedom. Who wants to live like that? So take a lesson from the land of the Bible. Being spiritually fit sometimes seems difficult. A word like discipleship can seem frightening. Trying to live like Jesus wants us to live can seem like an impossible task sometimes, but listen to the land. It's not impossible. In fact, there's rock everywhere in Israel. It's, it may be easier to succeed at this than it is to fail. Listen, are you looking to build your your house, your life on something solid. Watch what Jesus is doing and do that. That's what his disciples did. He said, follow me, and they followed. And when they followed, it was an amazing experience. When they left him, it was a disaster. So you and me, follow Jesus. Enjoy the journey along the way. Build your life on the rock. And as you work on your own spiritual fitness, encourage others to join you. Thank you so much for joining us for this edition of Secrets from the Ancient Past. If you're just now joining us, this is the final lesson of four lessons we've had on being spiritually fit. And I hope you'll go back and look on our website, secretsfromtheancientpast.com. You'll find other lessons that we've already had, other lessons on different topics. The land has so many secrets to share with us, not secrets as in you can never find them, but secrets that are hidden in plain sight. So I hope you'll join us. I hope you'll check out whatever's coming next. I'm already looking forward to seeing you next week. Until then, I'm Andy Cook.